All right. We have tons of students just joining us right now. Thank you so much for uh, joining. If you did just join us, please make sure you open up your chat box, say hello and where you are logging in from. Happy holidays to each of you. We're going to go ahead and get started in just a little bit. And just to let you know, we are live on YouTube. So if you want to share this uh, social media link to your Instagram or your Facebook or any other social media uh, source, I just linked it into the chat box so that each and every one of you can just spread this webinar as well as other webinars uh, to all of your friends. So excellent. Thank you so much. All right, as we go ahead and get started, do you mind putting into the chat box, if you hear me and see me, go ahead and type in yes into the chat box. Excellent, Andrea from New Jersey. We have Johnny Mohib, Taha, Madhu from Virginia. Johnny's from Albany. Thank you all so much for joining. I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that the live stream on YouTube is set. Great. We have Kesta from Nigeria on YouTube logging in. Thank you so much. Abdul, Saudi Arabia. Excellent. All right, everyone, it is 10 a.m. Eastern time. Thank you so much for joining me for this high yield session entitled High Yield Images for the USMLE Step 1. Now, this is going to kick off yet another YouTube series that I will be coming live to over the next couple weeks, but today will be an introduction as well as a special announcement. If you are new to the High Guru family, Welcome. My name is Rahul. I am in my final year of pediatric critical care fellowship. And over the past six years, I have been absolutely passionate about helping students just like you prepare for and excel on the USMLE. If you need help for the USMLE, feel free to check out my resources, highguru.com. And also make sure you stay in touch with me via email. I'll try my best to get back to you. Today is a very special webinar. I'm going to entitle it the holiday webinar. And for those of you celebrating, I want to wish you a very happy holidays and Merry Christmas. I thank you so much for joining me on probably your break time or taking a break from studying. I do want to just start with an introduction and just tell you why do I find High Guru and the way that I prepare students so unique. I know there are so many other resources out there. Now, when it came to creating this High Guru project, I wanted to really go into the evidence-based learning strategies. And so my lectures, including today's, all focus on active recall. Think about doing questions and content at the same time. I also focus a lot on integration. We are going to be using images today to integrate across various organ systems. And then finally, my courses are really focused on test taking strategy. I want to create a systematic approach so that you can get through a question in a very standardized way. And ultimately, you can think like the test maker. 
So when you do sign up for my courses or you prepare with me one-on-one, I focus on this triad. Number one, I focus on making sure that I help you apply the content that you're learning from various different resources, provide you sound test-taking strategy, make sure that you are productive and that you are going to have a schedule just set for you as you keep going through the material. And then finally, I make sure that you are going to tap into peak performance mindsets. And remember that this exam is not only you going through and doing the content, doing the questions, but it's also making sure you stay positive, both in the studying process as well as on exam day. Most importantly, what I absolutely love, and we have over 100 people joining us today, is that HiGuru is an absolute family. I have been absolutely blessed over the past six to seven years teaching live in classes throughout top schools in uh, the United States, just focused on USMLA preparation. And the pandemic has also kind of transitioned all of us to a more global community of lifelong learners when it comes to USMLA preparation and medicine in general. And we are going to be going through some high yield webinars over the next few months or, and uh, make sure that you are preparing in an optimal way. Today is, like I mentioned, not only a holiday webinar, but it is a very special webinar. And that is because I am absolutely humbled today to release my very own course, my USMLE pass fail course. Now, this is if you are going to need a rapid review of material and you want to cover everything from biochemistry all the way to pharmacology and everything in between. If you're going to be taking the exam after January 26th, this is going to be a course that is 110% meant for you. So please check it out. I'm going to go through it a little bit later on and give you a discount code if you stay until the end. But I did want to announce it right now and first want to make sure that I provide you immense, immense value. So let's go ahead and go through the introduction today. And that is going through high yield images for your USMLE step one. If you are ready to get started, go ahead and type in yes into the chat box. Can I get a High yield yes into the chat box if you're ready to get started. Excellent. Well, if you are going to spend this hour with me, I ask you that you put away distractions. I promise you I'm here to provide an energetic high yield review so that you can stay active and engaged. Make sure you turn off your phones, all those other tabs that you don't need, and just focus with me over this next hour. I promise you it is going to be jam-packed full of information. Like I mentioned today, we are going to go through an introduction of how to approach image questions for the USMLA. And in the coming weeks, we are going to go through the high yield images as well as physical exam findings for each of the organ systems. So I'm going to break it down. The next session, we're going to be going through the high yield images and physical exam findings for cardiology, endocrine, et cetera, et cetera. So make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel or on my website so that you do not miss a webinar and you know when exactly these webinars will be held. Let's go ahead and go through an overview of our introduction today. So today's session is going to focus on three important things. Number one, we are going to delve into how image questions or multimedia questions are actually written on your USMLE step one. Now, this is just taken directly from the NBME question writer guide. And I'm going to give you some important ways that the USMLE test writers write these questions and think about these questions. And then we are going to springboard into creating a test-taking strategy for approaching these images, multimedia, physical exam finding uh, questions on your USMLE. Finally, I do want to go through an application of our strategy. So we are going to be going through a grab bag, a mixed kind of review of all of the high yield images that you may see on test day. Like I said, in the subsequent sessions, we will be breaking each of the organ systems down. But today, I wanted to give you a test-taking strategy and an integrated overview. So let's go ahead and 
tackle our first objective. And that is kind of understanding how multimedia questions are exactly written. When we think about the NBME item writing guide, and I took the whole course that goes through how to write USMLA questions, the insights are the following. On your exam day, you are going to be getting either static images, patient photographs. You may get videos that you have to click on and put on your headphones, some interactive media, maybe like heart sounds, or even some sound files that could be uh, addressing any murmurs or any sort of lung finding, et cetera. So when you are practicing, you want to make sure that you clue in on some of these media types that you may see. And also, like we will do in this coming slides, create a test taking strategy for yourself. So you're going to be approaching each of these questions in a very systematic way. Now, which questions on the USMLE are going to be very, very uh, kind of tested on when it comes to media? Well, when it comes to media, you are going to get a lot of your DERM and MSK finding questions straight up using media. So maybe they give you a rash, maybe they are going to give you some sort of physical exam or musculoskeletal finding like a fracture or a radiograph. When it comes to cardiology, you may see some heart sounds where you're going to need to point the stethoscope into a certain area, or maybe you are going to look at an EKG and then you are going to get a sound bite of a various murmur. You may also get a video of neurological exam findings. Maybe they'll say, hey, click play and you'll see the pill rolling uh, tremor when it comes to Parkinson's disease. You may also, especially as the USMLE has changed um, in October and November to focus more on ethics and communication scenarios, you may get a video that pops out that kind of goes through a doctor-patient interaction, and then it'll pause and ask you, what's the next best response based on this current scenario? So these are the content areas that are conducive to the use of media. And so now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and go into a test-taking approach. And that is that an image that you will get on the USMLE will not be tested in isolation, i.e. the vignette will always be there and the vignette will give you a working diagnosis that your image is actually going to confirm. So you will not get a question that basically says, here's an image, what is it? You are going to get a vignette that then goes in conjunction with the image. And that's very important because when we look at a example question, the actual vignette will point to the image because as you can see, a photograph of the lesion is shown and that will direct your attention in this case to a static image. So I wanna give you a preparation tip before we get started. And that is that I would really focus on making sure you are studying images with the vignette. So through UWorld, through your NBMEs, through certain question banks and these reviews, but I wouldn't, want you to spend the time taking a whole Anki deck full of random images and try to memorize those images without a vignette. Because I think that you will be most likely wasting your time. Remember that this is not our, your radiology boards. This is not pathology boards. This is the USMLA step one. They want to give you images that are relatively high yield, but go in correlation with the vignette. And I really want to uh, give you this study point as you prepare for your exam. So what is the test taking strategy that I use when I go through an image question on the USMLA? Well, I use three steps. Number one, what I'll say is define the image. So as I get the vignette, the vignette will say a photo micrograph is shown. So I'll look at the image and I'll say, I need to define this image. And you're gonna define this image in three ways. You're gonna say, this is either a gross pathology image, a microscopic pathology image, or maybe it's a radiographic image, like an X-ray or a CT scan. Then what you'll do is you will say, of what is this image? And sometimes the vignette will actually tell you this is a photo micrograph of the skin, but you want to chant it out loud to yourself. So that this is a gross pathology of the kidney. So you want to ask yourself of what after defining the image. And then finally, what you want to do is you want to look for things that you know are normal, look for things that look a little bit abnormal to you, or when in doubt, 
make sure you look for asymmetry of the image. So if you cut the image in half and you see, oh, this side of the radiograph is a little bit different than this side. Well, there you have your abnormal area. So define the image, define what it is of, and then normal abnormal asymmetry. What you need to do now from this point forward is as you go through your NBME exams or question banks, you want to make sure you're applying this strategy. Let's go ahead and go through this strategy step-by-step. Step. All right, so a 40-year-old male with AIDS has a six-week history of right-hand weakness and mild headache. A CT scan is shown. So let's define the image. And we see that this is a radiograph. Of what is it? Of the brain. Look for normal, abnormal, or asymmetry. Remember that this is the right side of the brain. This is the left side of the brain, and we see that there is a circular enhancing intraparenchymal mass. So what is the likely causal organism here? Go ahead and put that in the chat. What do you think is the likely causal organism in this immunocompromised patient? All right, we have TB. A lot of people are saying toxoplasmosis, and you're absolutely correct if you said toxoplasmosis. So what we'll do today is use these questions to kind of jump into an integration of uh, the content. So essentially what we're doing is we're building this differential diagnosis for a ring enhancing lesion in the brain. And like many of you said, this is toxoplasmosis. So what are your USMLE vignettes going to show? Well, it's going to give you an immunocompromised patient, maybe for, uh, who has AIDS, and it will show multiple ring enhancing lesions on the MRI or a single ring enhancing lesion. The differential which you need to have is the fact that patients who are going to have these ring enhancing lesions can have them in an intraparenchymal or periventricular fashion, specifically when it comes to calcifications. When it comes to one of the differentials, which is congenital toxoplasmosis, this will be a neonate who has these intracranial calcifications within the parenchyma themselves. And that is different than cytomegalovirus because cytomegalovirus is going to give you periventricular calcifications. The way that I remember that is cytomegalovirus starts with C. The C makes me think of a ventricle and I'm putting calcifications surrounding that C. So periventricular calcification. And remember that your triad of Congenital toxoplasmosis is going to be chorioretinitis, so exam findings in the eye, inflammation of the retina. You're going to have hydrocephalus, so in large ventricles, as well as these intracranial calcifications. Again, that's different than your periventricular of CMV. Now, what's another differential for this ring-enhancing lesion? Similarly, you may want to have primary CNS lymphoma as your differential. And that is, again, a patient with an immunocompromised state who presents with confusion and seizures. And usually this is going to be differentiated from toxoplasmosis based on CSF findings. So CNS lymphoma, you may have these abnormal, atypical, malignant type cells, whereas you're going to have more infectious type of CSF when it comes to toxoplasmosis. Another way to think about it is say that they gave the actual uh, treatment for toxoplasmosis and the patient did not improve. You may then think of, ah, this might be primary CNS lymphoma. The other differential, which you want to keep here, is going to be a brain abscess. Now, these patients who have brain abscesses are going to maybe have a foreign body in the brain. So maybe they have a VP shunt or some sort of metal hardware point here is that when you have a foreign body, things like methicillin sensitive staph aureus or MRSA, they can actually stick to the uh, areas within the brain. And so that could be one differential. And another pathophysiologic mechanism or differential is the fact that they could have exposure to undercooked pork. And maybe you're thinking of neurosister psychosis in that standpoint. Usually patients with brain abscess will present with headache, this single ring enhancing lesion, but also a fever as well, because it's an abscess, so it's infection or inflammation. Finally, you may think of a tumor, 
and that is glioblastoma multiforme that can cause a ring enhancing lesion. Usually these patients are going to have a GFAP positive tumor. It will be of astrocyte origin. It may cross the corpus callosum. Remember that's known as a butterfly glioma. And on gross pathology, you will see necrosis, hemorrhage, or even microvascular proliferation due to increased amounts of VEGF. So this is your differential for a ring enhancing lesion on the USMLE. So now what we'll do is we'll pivot and we'll go through an application of the strategy. And I isolated some of the top images you will encounter on the USMLE. And again, throughout the next series of webinars, we're gonna be focused on each organ system and covering the images and physical exam findings for each of the organ systems. But today, it's just gonna be a broad overview for you. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and go through a multiple choice vignette. And we will then use the vignette, look at the picture, use our three-step strategy, which again, define the image of what is it, and then finally, look for normal, abnormal, or asymmetry. What we'll then do is we will take this vignette and picture and jump into some integrative content review so that you are going to stay active and engaged. If you all are sticking with me right now, go ahead and type in yes into the chat box just to make sure that you are paying attention. Awesome. Chani, Camille, Andrea. Excellent. Thank you guys so much for staying active and engage, let's go ahead and go through our first question. A 60-year-old male with history of alcoholism presents with vomiting bright red blood. The patient is tachycardic and hypotensive, so he sounds pretty sick. In the emergency department, despite resuscitation, the patient passes away. An autopsy is performed to identify the cause of death. An image of the esophagus is shown. So it is pointing us to the image. Let's go ahead and do our test taking strategy. This is going to be a gross pathology of the esophagus. And I see an abnormal proliferation of maybe clot or something like that in the bottom portion of that lower esophagus. Which of the following mechanisms most likely contributed to this patient's hemorrhage? A, eosinophilic esophagitis. B, deficiency of vitamin K dependent clotting factors, C, peptic ulcer disease, D, Barrett's esophagus, or E, imbalance of pressures in the cable portal system. Go ahead and put into the chat box what you think the answer is. Excellent. If you said E, you're absolutely correct. This is going to be a manifestation of portal hypertension. So when I think of portal hypertension, let's go through the content. Remember that from the gut, you have the portal system, and then that blood goes to the liver and gets drained into the hepatic or cable system. So what portal hypertension is, is that you have some liver pathology that then causes you to have an imbalance between your portal systems as well as your cable or inferior vena cava system. And as a result, you will see multiple different physical exam findings. Number one, like in our question, esophageal varices. Number two, you may get caput medusae. Number three, you may get rectal varices. And so when you're studying these and the anatomic integrations, you want to say, all right, when it comes to esophageal varices, there's a portal contribution, and then there's a cable contribution. And remember, portal hypertension just is going to be an imbalance of both of these due to a liver pathology. So specifically when it comes to esophageal varices, you have the left gastric vein that contributes to the esophageal varices from the portal side, i.e. going into the liver. And then from the cable side, you have the azagous vein that is going to be the cable contribution. And again, it's an imbalance. Let's move on to our next question here. A patient is noted to have 10 to 15 two centimeter lesions on her trunk neck, and lower extremities. The lesions have been present since birth. A lesion on our extremity is shown. So yet again, let's go ahead and do our test-taking strategy. This is a gross pathology of the skin, and I see a hyperpigmented lesion on the skin. Multiple family members 
are also known to have this lesion. So maybe this is going to be hereditary. Given this finding, the patient is most likely to have which associated pathology? A, renal angiomyelopomas, B, hamartomas seen in the iris, C, charcoalated crystals in the sputum, or D, ash leaf spots. What do you all think is the answer here? Awesome. If you are saying B in the chat box, you are absolutely correct. This is characteristically known as your leash nodules. So let's go ahead and integrate some high yield content review for neurofibromatosis. When it comes to neurofibromatosis, the brain pathology that you will see are meningiomas as well as seizures. The eye findings, which is what the answer was in our previous question, that will be related to these hamartomas in the iris, also known as Lish nodules. Patients with neurofibromatosis are also going to be at risk for optic nerve gliomas. So maybe they will have an afferent pupillary light defect. Maybe they will have some sort of vision loss. Patients with NF2 are going to have these acoustic neuromas. And these patients are going to present with signs of vestibulocochlear damage. So things like tinnitus, hearing loss, as well as vertigo. And then finally, you have your cafe au lait spots. And these are going to be hyperpigmented, whereas these ash leaf spots, which you're going to see in tuberous sclerosis, ash leaf spots are going to be hypopigmented. Okay. Very high yield for you to know. And that is tuberous sclerosis. Excellent. Let's go ahead and go through. This question, a 17-year-old boy presents to the emergency department after having a tonic-clonic seizure, so some sort of CNS issue. He is noted to have a skin exam shown in the photomicrograph. So going through our strategy, this is going to be a gross pathology of the head slash face and look for normal, abnormal, or asymmetry and we see that there are these pustular or raised flesh-colored lesions that are on the bridge of the nose and on the face. Upon further history, which of the following findings would likely be found? A, hearing loss, B, episodic depression, C, individualized learning plan in childhood, or D, family history of substance use. So this is a unique question. This is going to be your neurofibroma or your, uh, excuse me, the uh, skin lesions, the flesh colored skin lesions you will see in tuberous sclerosis. And what I want to go through now is the skin finding related to that. So you will get infantile spasms or subependal astrocytomas. Remember, infantile spasms are going to uh, be these episodic jerks of the upper extremities and the neck. You can also get in tuberous sclerosis, cardiac rhabdomyoma. So these are muscle tumors that are going to be primarily in the atria, and they are going to cause you to have some loss of preload to your ventricles. These patients can present on your USMLE with this abrupt mid-diastolic murmur, as well as valvular incompetence. Patients with tuberous sclerosis are going to have these renal angiomyolipomas. And so if you break this down, you have angio, which means blood vessel, myo, which means muscle, which you can see here, and then lipoma, which is going to be fat cells. And then finally, you are going to have these ash leaf spots, which are hypopigmented, shagreen patches. You may also get flesh colored uh, lesions because of, uh, uh, because of the actual proliferation on the skin and the hamartomas that you can see. And so this is a picture of your ash leaf spot. Now, patients with tuberous sclerosis, because they have infantile spasms, because they can have CNS issues, they can have developmental delay. And this is key for us to recognize for many syndromes. And I would encourage you to check out my syndromes webinar that I posted a few weeks ago, and it's on YouTube as well. Let's go ahead and go through this question. A 50-year-old male presents with weakness. He is noted to have hypertension, 
and hypokalemia. An abdominal CT scan reveals an adrenal mass. The patient undergoes biopsy of this mass. An electron micrograph image is shown of the adrenal cortex. So this is gonna be a microscopic pathology of what? Of the adrenal cortex and look for normal, abnormal, or asymmetry. So here I have the cortex. This is going to be the glomerulosa, the fasciculata, the reticularis. And remember, the fasciculata looks like a latte. You know, it's kind of milky. It has some more clear type of uh, uh, cells. And you have the medulla here. Okay. So as you kind of go through each of these, you want to know the patient's pathology is most closely resembled to which of the following areas. And that is going to be the glomerulosa. What's high yield for us to recognize here is that the patient has an aldosterone secreting tumor. And remember that whenever you have high amounts of aldosterone, that is going to cause you to have three things. Number one, it is going to cause you to bring in sodium. And as a result, you bring in free water and you're going to have increased blood pressure. If you have high aldosterone, you're also going to have peeing out of potassium. So you're going to have hypokalemia. And you will also have a peeing out of hydrogen ions. And so when you have low hydrogen ions, these patients will present with a metabolic alkalosis. So a test-taking strategy for you is the fact that if you see hypertension and hypokalemia, you should really say, where is my renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system upregulated? So hypertension and hypokalemia, where is RAS elevated? So let's go through a integrative type of approach. So you have a patient on your USMLE, you have hypertension in your vital signs, and then in the labs, they put hypokalemia. Now, when it comes to the differentials, Let's go through this one, high renin and high aldosterone. So this could be due to like a renin secreting tumor, or if you have effective uh, perfusion to the kidney, that is going to be decreased. So patients who have renal vascular hypertension is, are going to uh, be very classically presented on your USMLE as having either fibromuscular dysplasia. They may also have a aortic aneurysm or some sort of atherosclerotic risk factors, such as diabetes, uh, smoking, et cetera, and they will have a characteristic abdominal brewery. And as you have low effective perfusion to the kidney, the kidney and the juxtaglomerular apparatus is going to secrete high amounts of renin and downstream high aldosterone, which will give you hypertension and hypokalemia. Patients who are on diuretics, remember, they are going to have a decrease in intravascular volume. And that decrease in intravascular volume decreases the effective perfusion to the glomerulus. And subsequently, you are going to have a firing of renin. Finally, renin secreting tumors. Maybe you have a patient who has renal cell carcinoma on your exam. Those can give you high aldosterone downstream. What's important for you to recognize is that renin uh, or uh, renal cell carcinomas, the most common pathological variant is going to be the clear cell type. But also what you have to recognize is that these patients uh, present with painful hematuria and a flank mass. And that's different than, for example, bladder carcinoma. In bladder carcinoma, you have more painless hematuria. Next differential is when you have low renin and high aldosterone. And so just think about normal feedback. When we just talked about Kahn syndrome, which is high aldosterone uh, states, you are going to have a high aldosterone that feeds back and makes you have low renin. And this was the answer to our question previous. Finally, you are going to have a scenario where you have low renin and low aldosterone. And in this case, you are going to be thinking of non-aldosterone causes of hypertension and hypokalemia. So things like congenital adrenal hyperplasia, things like Cushing syndrome, all of those can cause you to have hypertension and hypokalemia. Specifically, when you're thinking about congenital adrenal hyperplasia, remember that these patients are likely going to have 11 beta hydroxy uh, uh, deficiency, hydroxylase deficiency. And that is going to be due to the fact 
that you have 11 doc, and that 11 doc is going to act like a weak mineralocorticoid. All right, going through this question. A 60-year-old male presents for follow-up. The patient has suffered from a myocardial infarction nine months prior. Since then, he has been seen as an outpatient for cardiac rehabilitation. His recovery was uneventful. A photomicrograph of the infarction is shown. So let's go through it here. We have a photomicrograph of the myocardium. So this is going to be a microscopic pathology of the myocardium. And I'm going to look for normal, abnormal, or asymmetry. And we see that these are the cardiac myocytes. And then you have this kind of col collagen-like or connective tissue substance that is going to be marked by X. And when you're nine months out, something to kind of consider is fibrosis tissue, because that's a chronic change in tissues that don't regenerate. So which of the following macrophage products is primarily responsible for the tissue labeled X? Let's go through the answer here. Go ahead and put that into the chat. Awesome. If you're saying A, you're absolutely correct. Remember, we are going to be thinking of fibrosis tissue. And remember that fibroblast growth factor is going to be active. Also, another cytokine for you to integrate is TGF beta. That's also going to proliferate fibrous tissue. So let's jump into the timeline of myocardial infarction. This is really important because what they'll do on your USMLE is they'll say, all right, here you have a patient who has elevated ST segment, and they have troponins that are elevated. And then afterwards, after this myocardial infarction, they'll give you a time period. So in our case, we talked about nine months afterwards, but they may say, hey, within four hours, what's the change you're going to see? And that is pretty minimal change. And in this very critical time period, not only are you going to get minimal change on your uh, gross uh, pathology or microscopic pathology, you will also have patients die of arrhythmia. And that is really, really important that patients usually die of arrhythmia within the first 24 hours after a myocardial infarction. After four uh, hours, within the first day, you will see early coagulation necrosis, as well as these wavy fibers. And the wavy fibers just represents that your myocardium is pretty compromised. Finally, you will get this release of calcium, and that will cause these myo uh, uh, fibrils to just get really contracted. And so contraction bands are seen within the first day. Subsequently, you will have within the first week, neutrophil migration. Now, neutrophils are going to cause you to have a lot of angry, angry inflammation. And it is at that time, around five-day mark, you can have structural complications related to your myocardial infarction. And so what are those going to be? Things like papillary wall rupture. You're going to have uh, a free wall rupture. Maybe you get acute tamponade. But the point here is that as you get coagulation necrosis, the neutrophils come in and they start chomping away on that tissue. Subsequently, I do want to let you know that at the one week mark, the macrophages come in. And macrophages are a little bit more calm. They kind of clean up all of the angry stuff that the neutrophils did. And then 10 days or two, two weeks and beyond, you are going to start developing granulation tissue that is composed of fibroblasts, capillaries, as well as myofibroblasts. And as you get further and further on, you will get a fibrotic scar on your myocardium. So the fibrotic scar is going to be made up of fibroblasts and fibrous tissue, as well as a collagen uh, deposition. So a uh, pathoma kind of mnemonic is going to be one day you get the contraction bands and one week you get the neutrophil migration. And then around one month or so, you will get the macrophages coming in. All right, let's go through this USMLA question. A 10-year-old female has fe fever, tiredness, and a petechial skin rash. Her laboratory studies show a low hemoglobin, low leukocyte count, 
and low platelets. So she has this pancytopenia, as you can see. Sorry about that. Low leukocyte count and low platelets. A bone marrow biopsy is performed. So let's go ahead and go through the test taking strategy. We see that this is a microscopic pathology of what? Of the bone marrow. And we see that here is a kind of collagen aspect of the bone marrow. And subsequently, you are going to have seen in this picture this fibrous tissue or this uh, lack of cells, i.e. there's more adipose tissue within the bone marrow. So what do you think is the most likely diagnosis here? A, ITP, B, cyanocobalamin deficiency, C, aplastic anemia, or D, ALL? What do you think is the answer? Awesome. If you put C, you are absolutely correct. So let's kind of go through this uh, differential of aplastic anemia. All right. And give me one second. My slides have a little bit of a glitch. All right, here we go. So when we think about aplastic anemia, we are going to think of patients who have primarily a disease of rapid turnover of red blood cells. So patients with sickle cell or hereditary spherocytosis, those patients who have chronic hemolysis. Subsequently, these patients can get infected with parvovirus B19. And remember that parvovirus B19, it's a DNA virus, and that is going to cause you to have bone marrow suppression. So your WBCs are going to be low, your RBCs are going to be low, and your platelets are going to be low. So how are patients in your vignettes going to present? Well, they're going to present with fatigue. They're going to present with some sort of mucosal bleeding or petechiae or because the leukocytes aren't there, they're gonna present with recurrent infections. So key things for us to recognize is that parvovirus is a small single-stranded linear DNA virus and can cause you to have a basically bone marrow failure in patients who have chronic hemolytic diseases. All right, continuing on with our review. Which of the following complications may be associated with this patient's condition? A 12-year-old female, was recently treated for pneumonia. The patient was found to have serologies for mycoplasma positive in the blood. A few days into her illness, she presents with multiple itchy targetoid lesions. Exam of the lesions is shown. So as you can see, this is a gross pathology of what? Of the hand and specifically the palms and soles, and that gives you a very narrow differential on the USMLE. And number three, look for normal, abnormal, or asymmetry. You see that this patient has a targetoid type rash in the setting of mycoplasma, and it has that dusky center. Which of the following complications may be associated with this patient's condition? A, hemoptysis and hematuria. B, superimposed HSV infection. C, anemia with Coombs positivity, or D, positive Nikolsky sign. What do you think is the answer here? All right, we have a lot of different answers, and the correct answer here is C, anemia with Coombs positivity. Because remember that the pathophysiology is very unique. Mycoplasma can not only cause you to have erythema multiform, which is the rash, but mycoplasma can also cause you to have a Coombs positive cold agglutinase reaction in which you have IgM that is going to destroy RBCs. And that's why you can have a normocytic hemolytic because the blood cells are, are breaking down hemolytic anemia. And so this is the cold agglutinins pathophysiology. And remember, mycoplasma uh, can cause you to have erythema multiform. So as you can see, this erythema multiform is going to be a rash that is on the palms and soles. So let's go ahead and go through some differentials when it comes to rash on the palms and soles. Again, it's a very narrow differential for you. The mnemonic I like to use is men drive Kawasaki CARS, C-A-R-S. 
So you have meningococcus, you have Kawasaki disease. I always think about Kawasaki disease with fever times five days. Any child who has fever times five days, you're going to be thinking of Kawasaki disease. Kawasaki A virus, remember that that causes hand, foot, and mouth disease, so a rash on the palms and soles. All others, so whether you're talking about erythema multiform, toxic shock syndrome, Janeway uh, lesions that you're going to see in rheumatic uh, fe uh, fever, you're going to be seeing these Osler nodes and Reiter syndrome. These are all going to be differentials that you will see. You have R, which stands for Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever, and then S, which is going to be secondary syphilis, all right? So these are all going to be your differentials for rash in on the palms and soles. And remember that when you're talking about rheumatic fever, that can cause infective endocarditis, and infective endocarditis can have these Janeway lesions and Osler nodes. But remember that the Janeway lesions and Osler nodes are not part of your criteria for rheumatic fever. The carditis and the infective endocarditis can give you the painless Janeway lesions and the painful Osler nodes. All right, continuing on. A 55-year-old man is in the neurological ICU after suffering a stroke. The patient undergoes an MRI of the brain. The imaging is shown. So this is going to be a radiographic image of what? Of the brain. Look for normal, abnormal, or asymmetry. And we see that there is an asymmetric hyperenhancing lesion right on the left MCA territory. Which of the following symptoms may this patient have? A, bitemporal hemianopsia. B, left-sided weakness of face and dysarthria, C, right-sided weakness of face and dysarthria, D, pure sensory loss of the contralateral body, or E, weakness of the trunk. What do you all think is the answer here? Excellent, very good. Very proud of each of you. And if you said right-sided weakness of face and dysarthria, you are absolutely correct. Now, ladies and gentlemen, remember that when it comes to strokes, you want to integrate the homunculus. That's very high yield for you to know. The trunk is going to be in your ACA territory, whereas the face and the upper limb is going to be in your MCA territory, along with your language centers, specifically on your dominant language centers, which is the left side. So just to integrate localizing strokes, remember when you have ACA deficits, you have sensory motor deficits that is going to be contralateral and it is going to involve the trunk and the lower limb. MCA, you are going to have upper limb and face sensory motor deficits and then make sure you're integrating, especially if it's on the dominant side, you are integrating your language deficits. And then the posterior cerebral artery, remember that that is related to your vertebrals coming up into your basilar and subsequently giving the PCA, which is the back part of that circle of willis, you are going to have your occipital lobe that is going to be damaged. So these patients are going to have this contralateral homonymous hemianopsia. And that means that the same visual field is actually going to be affected. Almost done here. Stay active and engage with me. Let's go through this question. A patient three months post-renal transplant has increasing dyspnea, so this shortness of breath. An x-ray shows atypical interstitial infiltrates. A bronchoalveolar lavage and lung biopsy is performed, and a sample is shown in the micrograph. So let's go through our three-step strategy. Step one, what kind of image is it? This is a microscopic pathology of what? Of the lung tissue and look for normal, abnormal, or asymmetry. And I see this abnormal owl's eye nuclei or these intra DNA or uh, intra nuclear infiltrates here. And that is the characteristic finding of cytomegalovirus. Very high yield for you to know. So CMV is going to cause this owl's eye nuclei. Remember that a differential could be, if you're thinking oncological, 
the Reed Sternberg cells. They both have these owl eye nuclei, but in this immunocompromised patient and him uh, having a pneumonia, you're going to be thinking of CMV. Let's pivot and talk about this question. A teenage girl is noted to have sore throat, fever, and malaise, so constitutional symptoms. She has tender cervical lymphadenopathy. Abdominal exam reveals a left upper quadrant mass. So you're going to kind of localize your pathology here. Laboratory studies show a normal hemoglobin, a slight elevation in leukocyte count with lymphocytic predominance. A peripheral blood smear is shown. So this is going to be a microscopic pathology of what? Of the blood. Look for normal, abnormal, or asymmetry. And you see these atypical cells that are going to be caressing the surrounding RBCs. What is the most likely diagnosis? Go ahead and put that into the chat box. And you're absolutely correct if you said infectious mononucleosis. This left upper quadrant mass, this is going to represent some splenomegaly. And remember that they could give you a physician communication question that is related to infectious mononucleosis. And the answer typically is going to be avoid contact sports. Very high yield for you to know. So remember that infectious mononucleosis is going to be related to EBV. And EBV is what we call a oncogenic microbe. So it is a microbe that actually is going to be related to certain cancers. So things like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, things like oral hairy leukoplakia, which can be found on the tongue, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which can be seen in Chinese uh, uh, patients who present with a nasopharyngeal mass. CNS lymphoma, which presents as a ring-enhancing lesion in an immunocompromised patient. Diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which is at times thought to be a subtype of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, as well as Burkitt's lymphoma, yet another subtype of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So patients who are going to have these types of tumors, in your vignettes, they will put the tumor stains positive for EBV, and so I just want you to kind of integrate all of the various tumors. An 86-year-old man presents with his wife for progressive memory loss. His wife states that the patient is unable to balance his checkbooks. A medication is prescribed to improve these symptoms. The patient on follow-up one year later dies. Autopsy is performed and sample brain tissue is shown. This is going to be a microscopic pathology of what? Of the brain tissue. And what do we see here? We see this characteristic dark staining tangle-like substance. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's demise? And if you said Alzheimer's disease, you are absolutely correct. Remember that when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, these patients are going to have A beta plaques and these neurofibrillary tangles. So let's go ahead and go through a differential when it comes to Alzheimer's disease. With Alzheimer's disease, you want to be also thinking of PICS disease, which is also known as frontotemporal dementia. These patients are going to have issues with the frontal lobe. So they are going to have hypersexual and aggressive behavior. They are going to have atrophy on gross pathology of the frontal and temporal lobes, and they have these intracytoplasmic inclusions of tau, and this is an autosomal dominant dementia. Alzheimer's disease patients are going to be a little bit older. They are going to have a progressive loss of activities of daily living, a relatively normal physical exam, and they are going to have these neurofibrillary tangles, which is going to be related to hyperphosphorylated tau, and a beta plaques. Now, what's important for us to know is that there's an association with Down syndrome because the amyloid precursor protein, which is going to be related to the formation of A beta plaques is found on chromosome 21, as well as an association with APOE4. Remember that both frontotemporal dementia and Alzheimer's disease both have dementia and they are going to have tau related to them. 
A patient is found to have the following physical exam finding shown in the image. So this is going to be a gross pathology of what? Of the back. And you see that there is some asymmetry such that the right scapula is kind of protruding out. Which of the following nerve muscle pairs are likely injured? Go ahead and put that into the chat. Excellent. Very good. And if you said long thoracic, you are absolutely correct. That is related to serratus anterior. And remember that this pathology is known as winged scapula. And this is a brachial plexus injury. And you see that the long thoracic nerve comes from your cervical roots, which is the first portion of your brachial plexus. All right. I think this is one of the last questions. So let's go ahead and go through it. A patient presents with the physical exam finding shown after excision of a right-sided neck mass. Which of the following nerve fibers are likely affected? So this is going to be a gross pathology of what? Of the face and the eye. And we see some asymmetry. We see that on the right side where the lesion was excised, you see some ptosis. You see that this pupil is a little bit smaller, okay? And when you're thinking of this, it's pointing to a characteristic triad. So what do you think the answer is here? The parasympathetic, sympathetic. Awesome. And if you said post synaptic fibers of the superior cervical ganglion, you are absolutely correct. So in this finding, you are looking at Horner syndrome and a actual uh, a loss of your sympathetics. So let's quickly go through an autonomic nervous system integration. Remember that the autonomic nervous system is going to arise from the CNS and you are going to have various ganglia. You have presynaptic ganglia, and fibers, as well as the postsynaptic. So the presynaptic of the sympathetic nervous system, those are going to be very short, the presynaptic fibers. And the postsynaptic fibers, okay, are going to be a little bit different. And those postsynaptic sympathetic fibers, those postsynaptic sympathetic fibers are actually going to be long. That is different than your parasympathetic. Because in your parasympathetic, your preganglionic fibers are actually going to be very long. And the postsynaptic ganglionic fibers, those are going to be short. They're actually going to be embedded within the wall of the effector organ. So when we're thinking about the sympathetic nervous system, especially at the upper cervical thoracic areas, a disruption of that sympathetic gives you Horner syndrome, which presents as a triad of ptosis, so lid drooping on your physical exam, meiosis, so a pupil that is going to be small, and anhydrosis, so maybe they'll put flushing of the face. All right, excellent. So that concludes our webinar today. And I would really encourage you to stick around for this special announcement. And that is that I just released my USMLE Step 1 Pass-Fail course. And I want to make sure that I go through what all you will get when it comes to signing up for this course. This is the Step 1 discipline specifications taken directly from the USMLE website. And within 50 hours, you will be able to go through my pass-fail course in the highest yield concepts as it relates to pathology, pharmacology, biochemistry. We're going to have a sec section on anatomy, as well as a section on genetics and physician communication. So I've mapped a lot of these lectures to what you're actually going to be finding on the USMLE website. And so what I want to make sure that you do is not only do you just pass the exam and get that minimum score, but you also excel and you make sure that you set up the foundations and the fundamentals for your step two CK, as well as clinical practice. 
My lectures in this course are actually organized in very small bite-sized pieces. And each of the sections have a handout for you to follow along with. When you sign up for this course, and especially related to the NBME top concepts portion, you will get customized UWorld question IDs that are mapped to each and every video such that you take these UWorld question IDs after you watch each video or all of the videos, and you can make a custom UWorld block so that you can go through the high yield material that was covered in the active recall session. This is going to be very unique because it allows for you to have a very tailored approach to your learning. So please make sure that you sign up for the pass fail course. I'm pricing it very fairly at 196, but because you joined today, ladies and gentlemen, I want to provide you a discount code. Go ahead and write this down. I'm going to also type it in the chat box as well, but you have your high guru holiday 2021. So high guru holiday 2021 as your, uh, as your discount code. And I encourage you to sign up online. It's on my uh, website, highguru.com. And I encourage you to join the High Guru family. I have a study plan course as well as a test taking course that's releasing a week from now. So make sure you sign up for all of the courses as well as my webinars. And I just want to say a very, very big thank you to each and every one of you for joining me on this journey. Make sure you're tagging me in on social media. Sign up under my YouTube, email me, stay in contact with me. And I will see you in the upcoming webinars. So sign up via Zoom. Let your friends know. We're going to be going through the high yield images as well as physical exam findings. And then finally, if you feel so inclined, it's just going to take you a few minutes. Please make sure you visit my Trustpilot page. You can Google High Guru Trustpilot and just post an honest review. I don't spend any money on marketing or anything like that. I just want to make sure that we keep spreading the word of High Guru student by student, review by review. So it would mean so much to me if you go ahead and uh, write a review. Before you leave today, please make sure that you type in one thing that you learned from the chat box. Go ahead and type in that one thing you learned into the chat box. And I'm going to go ahead and stick around for any questions. I appreciate your time, your attention, and your enthusiasm for learning. All right. Excellent. So we have nice differentiation of PICS and Alzheimer's disease. Excellent.